Hi, everybody. My name is Stuart Ellis. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer and founder of Charter School Capital. And uh, we're excited today to uh, bring you this discussion of um, COVID-19 uh, research, vaccines, uh, et cetera. And uh, our special guest today is Dr. Gregory Poland uh, of uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic, and uh, he's the director of uh, Mayo's Vaccine Research Group and the editor-in-chief of uh, Vaccine. Um, and uh, we've had uh, Dr. Poland on with us before uh, some months ago uh, as COVID-19 uh, began to spread across the country, uh, talking about the impact on schools and, and safety measures. And today, uh, we're really honored to have Dr. Poland with us again today to talk about vaccine status, additional safety measures, and just provide some information uh, from his expertise on how things might be affecting your schools as uh, we roll things out. Um, Charter School Capital is uh, engaged in these kind of uh, webinars and content provisions to the Charter School uh, Network, supporting uh, more than 700 charter schools that we've uh, funded over the years, and uh, now uh, well over one and a quarter million kids we've supported and more than two billion invested in the industry. Um, and we're excited to have experts like Dr. Poland to uh, help the schools we serve and the charter school movement in general. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for joining us and I wanna turn it over to Dr. Poland. Greg? All right, thank you. Can you hear me well? I can. Okay. Well, good afternoon to everybody. Um, this is one of those uh, talks that's going to be a high altitude. You can tell that from the title. We're going to talk about principles, prejudices, pipelines, porcupines, and products. It's uh, also not necessarily very fun to say that everything we talked about last March that I uh, clued you into has indeed come to pass. And I'm going to make that same prediction for the things that I talked to you about today. Uh, first, my disclosures, I offer consultative advice on COVID-19 vaccine development to a number of the uh, major uh, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers. We've received funding to develop a vaccine at Mayo Clinic, and uh, these are all done in accordance with Mayo Clinic policies. Well, I'm going to start with a quote from Albert Camus, who was writing about a different kind of plague in a different era, but he said this, they fancied themselves free, but no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. Well, the reality is there is no safe. That is an illusion. There is safer, but it requires an array of technological, behavioral, and societal interventions that the U.S. has demonstrated it's unwilling to engage in. The consequence is, and will continue to be, an ongoing pandemic that will search out as many susceptibles as possible and likely continue on as an endemic disease. Now, there's some principles in what I'm going to say, and that is I'm going to be as scientifically evidence-based because I'm not interested in what we feel, but what does the science say? And science has a rational and defined basis. It's intentional and explicit. The two hallmarks of good science are repeatability and generalizability. It is peer reviewed and agnostic to results and fares best in environments of open inquiry with exclusion of conflicts of interest and the willingness to question dogma and biases. The other point is that the bar for vaccine approval must necessarily be very high in regards to safety. We are, after all, asking healthy people to receive a biologic product to prevent an infection they may or may not have or be exposed to. And the other point I think we've all seen play out is that science and politics mix very poorly. Prejudices. Well, you can have your own opinions, and each of us does but not your own facts. It turns out that scientific truth isn't a democracy. And that leads to the second point. There are massive global, national, and local political and economic conflicts of interest, which is 
conflated an effective response to COVID-19. As an example, one out of every 1,400 Americans that was with us last Christmas is now dead of COVID. And the likelihood is that we will see many more hundreds of thousands of deaths. The only rational response then is evidence-based policies and procedures built on these hallmarks of science. But there are porcupines in the way. The perception that Operation Warp Speed uh, has led to cutting corners in vaccine development. How will we allocate vaccines? Will it be through our usual utilitarian mechanism or will it be more egalitarian? What about vaccine safety and the uh, ever-present politicalization of science? Are we being transparent? What about vaccine costs and profit profiteering by CEOs? Uh, overlapping negatively synergistic threats, which I will come back to later, and a cacophony of myths and disinformation with everybody spouting their own opinion. There's been public concern over, quote, genetic and viral vectored vaccines. And multiple polls now show that in the US, somewhere between 50 to maybe even 60% may reject the front runner vaccines. Magnified concerns since these have not been studied in children and pregnant women. We've certainly seen the perverse effects of science by press release. For example, the many people harmed by the false information regarding hydroxychloroquine. Public concern over vaccine safety is at an all-time high. And we have made the mistake, in fact, much of America has been scammed by conflating economic, political, and religious agendas with the science of mask wearing and physical, physical distancing, as well as vaccine acceptance and rejection. Well, George Bernard Shaw said, we learn from history that men never learn anything from history. I'm in my last year of seminary training, and I just did an elective with a 60-some page paper on uh, England in the 1500s and 1600s during the time of plague. And I can sum up what I found pretty uh, simply. What we have learned about the public management of uh, plagues and pandemics could be summarized in one word over the last 500 years. Nothing. Well, let's jump into the products. Uh, as you know, there are currently no vaccines licensed in the U.S. We have no clear correlates of protection. In other words, we can't do a blood test and say you're protected. An uncertain regulatory pathway. Will there be an emergency use authorization? expanded access or a fully licensed vaccine. Multiple vaccines in development. And the reality of it is, I think it'll be three to six months before those of you in the audience, for example, uh, would actually have access to a vaccine if everything goes right and there are no barriers. Unless we use other mechanisms like EUA and expanded access. But you must understand there's an irresolvable tension between speed and safety. The ideal vaccine profile would demonstrate excellent safety. We don't know if we have that yet. Can be quickly mass produced. I think we'll meet that. Would be stable at room temperature and avoid cold and ultra cold chain and transportation issues. We won't meet that could be stored indefinitely, we won't meet that, would have mass administration mechanisms that don't require highly trained healthcare providers, we won't meet that. All of the vaccines that are the front runner vaccines you've heard about are so-called S only vaccines. Um, they're all okay, S good. only, the S stands for spike protein, which is where its Latin name is derived from, corona, it looks like a crown. And uh, in various ways, what we're doing is trying to mimic the virus by injecting a vaccine that contains this S protein. So there are inactivated vaccines. Those are not being tested in the U.S. The four front runners involve two 
um, adenovirus vectored vaccines and two mRNA vaccines. So let me take those kind of one at a time. The idea behind an adenovirus is to take a common cold virus, insert the gene for the coronavirus S protein into it, if you will, infect you with the adenovirus, uh, which cannot replicate or reproduce itself. It expresses that gene for S protein, produces S protein, and then your immune system responds to it. So uh, the AstraZeneca is using a chimpanzee adenovirus, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is using, as I say, a common cold vaccine. Both of those are reactogenic vaccines, that is, they cause side effects, because it requires that they give pretty high doses. Um, and as a result, people develop sore arms, fevers, things like that. Both of them protected non-human primates in challenge studies. Both of them raise balanced immune responses. And both of them produce neutralizing antibody levels in humans that are about equivalent to what we see in convalescent plasma, that is, humans that were documented to have been infected with coronavirus and then, um, and then had their blood drawn. The next two are mRNA vaccines. What that stands for is these are genetic vaccines. What we do is we piece together the nucleic acids that together compose the genetic code for the S protein. These are then injected into humans because mRNA vaccines are not very stable, require a cold chain, and require high doses. So they also are reactogenic. Both of them protected, just like the adenovirus vaccines, both of them protected non-human primates against challenge with the wild virus. Uh, both produced uh, high levels of neutralizing antibody. And you heard yesterday or Monday, I, in fact, I had to change my slides, uh, about the press release from Pfizer. Now, let me set an appropriate stage, because if what you read was a headline saying the Pfizer vaccine was 90% effective, you've been scammed. That is, you've been led to believe a totality of information that Pfizer is not actually telling you. What Pfizer is telling us is what they have, the very earliest sliver of data from their 44,000 person clinical trial. In particular, what they're saying is that in their, in their early study among people who had not had prior evidence of infection, seven days after their second dose, there was 90% efficacy in preventing mild to moderate disease. This is not the same thing as, well, how did it protect people who had prior disease and now are at risk of reinfection? It did not study children, pregnant women, the eldest of the oldest, uh, some minority subgroups, um, people who are highly immunocompromised, and people with a variety of comorbid conditions. So in the very narrow confines of a clinical trial where everything goes perfectly, they showed 90% efficacy. It also doesn't tell us whether, it's whether there's efficacy against severe disease, hospitalization, severe complications, death. We don't know that yet. We don't yet know about safety other than short term. They plan on looking at one month, six months, 12 months, and 24 months after that second dose, but only the passage of time, of course, will garner us those data. There's some provisos. The Pfizer study requires ultra cold storage because mRNA is inherently unstable. And so it requires shipping at minus 80 degrees centigrade or 103 de minus 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, your local hospitals do not have that storage capacity. We don't yet know, as I said, about long-term safety. We don't know anything about the durability 
of that immune response. In other words, how long are you protected? It's fine to be protected seven days after the second dose, but how long will that last? Um, remember something I don't think any other scientist has picked up on. I mentioned it to the media and nobody else apparently thought of it. These are studies being conducted in regions of the world where for the most part we are wearing masks and socially distanced. What would be the efficacy of the vaccine when masks are off? We don't know. And finally, these are, as I uh, say with all four of these, these are novel vaccine platforms. We have never used this particular platform to mass immunize um, human beings before. So uh, there's an old saying of you don't know what you don't know. Why am I sort of dwelling on this? It's because what we have noticed as scientists is that uh, nine and 10 and 11 months in now to this pandemic, people are developing COVID fatigue and they're beginning to act and think in irrational ways where we had 30 and 50,000 cases a day. We're now at 120,000 cases. We're duplicates worse than we were. We are now on the exponential side of this curve and you cannot manage exponentiality. It's too late, we blew it. What you could do is wait for the virus to change, hopefully in a better way. You could enforce as Utah is now and some other countries are, that there would be soft or hard lockdowns with mandatory mask wearing enforced by large fines, um, or you could mass immunize a population. None of those have been particularly appealing in the US. And so the outbreak is, as I say, out of control now in the US. In the US, we have as many cases as the continent, uh, continental Europe. We have as many deaths as they do. As I say, one out of 1,400 Americans, not equally distributed, but one out of 1,400 Americans is already dead of COVID. Um, and it just keeps increasing. So clearly, we have to do something. Well, what Good about- Dr. Poland? Yes. Um, I, I wonder, so we have this, the materials up on the screen for everybody again, and we paused on the Pfizer press release. Um, uh, uh, if it's all right, we'll scroll, continue to scroll uh, um, gradually through, but where would you like us to uh, move to now in the material? The problem is since I can't see my slides, I don't know where you are or what the next one is. Okay, so <laughs> you could tell me You could tell me the title and I could do that. Well, so, um, you had rolled through to the Pfizer press release, and um, we talked about the reactogenic vaccine um, uh, approach and what was going on there. Um, right. and if, then, you me, if you just give me the title of the next slide, I can I can do it, if you will, blind. Okay. Um, the next page was uh, uh, if we'll we'll scroll to that one right now, and that's the protein-based vaccines. Yeah. Okay. And so. We We've covered those. And then the one after that is Novavax, recombinant S protein. Okay, so Novavax is now not one of the four front runners, but is up and coming. And what they've done is they've taken the S protein itself, combined it with a proprietary adjuvant. An adjuvant is just a chemical to stimulate the immune system. And what's interesting, this is still a, a two dose, though it might potentially be a one dose injectable vaccine. What's interesting about this vaccine is that it raised antibody levels about four fold higher than what people who were actually infected with the virus carry in their blood. So that's a potentially very promising vaccine. Okay, next slide then would be what? The next slide is a schedule um, overview of phase one and phase two results. Okay, we can skip to the next one. Which is a current vaccine summary opening about, you know, yeah. the no okay. clear winner. So, so we have no clear cut winner here. 
We don't know about durability of immune response. We have only a modicum of information about safety. As I said, we have no correlate of protection. Um, these are all novel platforms. We don't know yet. The important thing about a vaccine would be that it not only prevented mild disease, but prevented severe disease and prevented transmission. Um, and we don't, we don't clearly have either of those yet. Okay, next slide. Well, what do we do now? Now what? Okay. So if you go to the next slide after that, the issue is going to be uh, vaccine allocation and safety. Let me take safety first. So this, va these vaccine trials are statistically powered around the ability to detect a significant side effect that occurs one in 5,000 times or more often, okay? So why do I mention that? Um, many Americans, in fact, half of Americans don't take flu vaccine every year. And one of the major reasons they don't do it is they remember to uh, uh, 1976, 77, when there was the threat of an influenza pandemic, an influenza vaccine under uh, President Ford was prepared and getting ready to be mass administered. And they noticed an association with uh, a syndrome called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an, a paralysis that's reversible, but a paralysis. And that occurred one in a million times, okay? So, People remember that. They won't get the vaccine because of the risk of one in a million. All we're being able to determine about safety in these vaccines is about one in 5,000. Now that's not a reason to take the vaccine, but it's a reason to think through, am I fully informed about what I'm, what I'm taking? Um, we won't know about one in 10,000 or one in 100,000 or one in a million. We never do until the vaccine is released and widely used. The next slide, I believe, talks about vaccine allocation. And if you go one more slide past the, uh, uh, there's a picture so of the U.S. The, ne the next slide is talking about the COVID, the various S-only approaches. SARS, okay. COVID-2 as an RNA yeah. virus. And okay, so um, as I said, these are S-only vaccines. My personal belief, and I published this, I think the next slide might even show it, is um, that this may well be the Achilles heel of these vaccines. SARS, COVID-2 is an RNA virus. RNA viruses, by their very nature, mutate and undergo genetic recombination with other coronaviruses. You're seeing this play out in real time in Denmark. There is a novel strain that infected mink, and then mink has, th that strain has infected 12 humans. This is a zoonotic infection, meaning it's passed by animals, not dogs and cats so much as mink and other species. The implication of that is that the virus is changing. In fact, in Europe right now, there are two new variants of the virus called EU20A1 and 2. They are now accounting for 40 to 70% of the new infections in places like Spain, Switzerland, Norway, the Netherlands, France, the UK, Ireland. Though That will come to the US too. What we don't know is the implication of that. Will this virus mutate to become less lethal? Or will it mutate to become more severe? There's a slide there that shows a piece of data where um, a group of investigators at the Rockefeller Institute tried to duplicate the rapid passage through humans by growing human cells in, in, laboratory, in the laboratory in petri dishes and then rapidly passaging the virus through it. And what they demonstrated, if you see the slide that shows a lot of dots, is that there are a series of dots, mutations of this virus that evaded the ability of human convalescent plasma to neutralize it. 
they also evaded the ability of monoclonal antibodies. These are treatments, evaded the um, treatment by these monoclonal antibodies. So the virus clearly does mutate, as I say, clearly does change and can change in an adverse way. We only know that, generally speaking, it, retrospectively. If we begin to detect that, gee, this seems to be getting more severe or there's some new characteristic about this infection, you and I don't get to pick if that's going to happen. That's a property of the virus in a cultural setting where people are unwilling to distance. Um, okay, next slide then. So the next slide um, actually gets into, we talked about the headline news that I think you've already touched on, but this is about the genetic study of the virus conducted in Houston. And then the one after that actually goes into uh, first wave, second wave on SARS mutation. Yeah, I think the point to make about the slide with the sort of orange curve on it uh, that came out of Houston is we we are now throughout the U.S. The strain that is circulating is not the strain that started here uh, back in in February and, and March. It is it is a mutant called the D to G six fourteen strain. It appears that that may be a more transmissible virus. It does not appear to be any, any more lethal than the original strain. The problem will be if mutations occur around what's called the receptor binding domain of this S protein with its receptor. In other words, will the virus be able to infect us more easily? The early answer, though controversial, is that that may have happened with this strain and may be in part responsible other than human behavior for the fact that we're seeing such an exponential uptick in infections. Okay, what would the next slide be? What does be? that mean as, as you go through and talk about this? What is, uh, Brittany, you can go ahead and move to the next page. The What does that mean for um, the transmission um, and the effect of the vaccines that are being worked? Are the vaccines well, really, being developed going to not affect the uh, mutated uh, virus? Well, that's what, I, that's what I'm raising. We don't know yet, but this is mm -hmm. a, a, a caution to be aware of. And that's why I call it the potential Achilles heel of these viruses. The, the scientific question is, could the virus mutate such that it escapes the immune response induced by these vaccines? Only okay. time will tell. Okay. So the, the page we're on is the editorial uh, from Vaccine about tortoises, hares, and vaccines. Yeah. So this was the publication that, that I wrote, you know, alerting the world to this, uh, to this possibility. It was published some months ago. I would say wasn't taken too seriously, but has, uh, in fact, uh, started to become uh, evident that it's true. We'll see what the what the final implications are. Next slide. So uh, here we're talking about vaccine allocation, and we transition there to allocation in the U.S. And we'll move so, to the next one. Yeah. So. So allocation is not entirely clear. You should be seeing sort of a step uh, slide that indica indicates different groups. Is that the slide you're on? The first is a discussion about the vaccine arithmetic against the 350 million okay. U.S. I, I, and global citizens. All right, I'll, I'll talk about that first then. So, you know, in the U.S., we have 300 and roughly 350 million people. These vaccines are going to take two doses. Um, we don't know whether the vaccines can be interchangeable or not. So when you do this kind of arithmetic, both in the U.S. and, and worldwide, you realize we've never done this before in human history. Will we actually be able to do it? Will we be able to do it in a timely manner? You go to the next slide. I think that should be that step slide. Yep. yep. Okay. So the likely people who will get the first doses 
will be those at highest risk, um, healthcare providers, and maybe the uh, elderly who, ha who are frail or have other complications. The group right after that, sort of the essential workers um, category. And then it will go from there. The point being is that it will take months and months to distribute this. It's likely, as I say, that the people on this call, for example, would not get a dose of vaccine until somewhere in the late first quarter or maybe into the second quarter or later of 2021. So the precautions we're talking about have to be maintained. We don't yet know what the true efficacy of these vaccines will be. What do, what do I mean by that? What is the efficacy like when it is not being given in the context of a strictly controlled clinical trial, but in the sloppiness, if you will, of field use? Um, we know that vaccines don't always get stored properly. We know that people don't come back on time for when they should get a, a dose. We know that people who have reactions to the first dose are much more hesitant to come back for their second dose. We're wearing masks, as I say. Some of us are distancing. What happens when we're not doing that? What we always find is that the efficacy in a clinical trial is higher than the efficacy when it's applied to the broad population for these and, and other reasons. Next slide. And is that, as you, as you talk about or compare the rollout in the, the general populace as opposed to uh, in a testing environment, um, in, in our previous discussions, you mentioned the differences in behavior of people involved in human trials as opposed to can you talk about that a little bit? Why is it that yeah, so what you know, happens it always, it is that and, uh, for every clinical trial, there are inclusion, in other words, they have to meet certain criteria to get into the clinical trial, and exclusion criteria. If they have certain medical problems or issues, uh, we're not going to admit them into the trial. So they don't reflect the broad population. For example, how many Native American obese diabetics are there in these trials? My guess is maybe a few handfuls, if any. And so we can't really say much about that population. What about an 85-year-old uh, lady in the nursing home who's taking medication for her autoimmune disease? We won't know what that vaccine might, might work or look like. As I said, pregnant women, children, uh, perhaps people with HIV infection. We, we won't have large numbers in those clinical trials that would allow us to extrapolate to what will it actually be like in, in normal use. Maybe it's a bit, to use a silly analogy, maybe it's a bit like the difference in the performance of a highly tuned car on a test racetrack versus how it actually operates uh, month by month, year by year on the potholed uh, American roads. <laughs> uh, very right. different. Yep, that's helpful. So um, we, we, we moved from the, uh, your thoughts on the caveats to the CDC study from March through September. Can you uh, share with us? Your insights yeah. there. You you you'll be able to. Uh, can, are others able to see your slides or no? Everybody is seeing the slides except okay. you. Okay. So I won't. I, I won't. I gotta say. I gotta say. Much like uh, Ralph Macchio's character in the original uh, Karate Kid, um, your ability to walk through this completely blind, not seeing the slides, not knowing anything, not knowing what everybody else is saying, is quite impressive. Well. So. Thank you. Thank you for that, because I'm sitting here feeling, feeling embarrassed and wanting to throw. This has never happened to me. I've given, I don't know, probably about 1,500 public talks, and this has never happened. So it's a speaker's nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> uh, of but, course. But I'm saying you, you have the, you're, it's just you're, like blindfolded, knocking out the other guy. All you're doing is displaying that you have a deep understanding of the subject. So that's really helpful. So the CDC you. study? 
Yeah, so you're, you're seeing the actual uh, data there. But what they did is they're looking at the number of known SARS-CoV-2 infections. This is a gross underestimate. These are just the ones that came and got tested. Um, but you're looking at the number of uh, uh, infections in children, which I thought would be relevant to this group, given you know what you're all about. Um, sure. And the number, the, the number, what's that? Yeah, sure. Kids in school. Yep. Yeah. And then the number of uh, hospitalizations. And fortunately, the relatively small, I mean, it's not to those families, but 51 known deaths. The, the point being here is that this virus, because uh, there's, there's misinformation out there of, oh, it's not an issue for kids. It is an issue for kids in several respects. Number one, they get sick from it. They don't tend to get as sick as adults, but they do get sick. Number two, they transmit it to other people, particularly their parents, other adults, uh, whatever venues they're in, their school teachers. Um, this has been a major issue among some school districts, in fact. Um, when you look at the, and then, and then some of these kids do get sick, it is astounding the percentage of American kids that have risk factors for more severe disease, like obesity, like um, asthma, like certain medications that they're uh, taking, diabetes. So you actually, you know, when, when you look compared to other countries, America would be considered a, quote, sick culture. Um, I'll just give you one other view into that. I was the past president of the Defense Health Board uh, reporting to Secretary Rumsfeld. And we wrote a report called Too Fat to Fight. Not a great title, but it caught attention. And basically what we showed is that uh, two thirds of draft age Americans were not eligible to enter the military either because of obesity substance abuse or mental health issues. That's astounding and has never before been seen in human history. Um, and unfortunately, America kind of leads the pack uh, in, in that direction. So uh, just, just a slide to show that uh, please don't suffer under the misperception that, that kids don't get sick and that kids don't die. Uh, from this. They, they certainly do, though thankfully not at the rates that older adults do. Okay, next slide. So here we're talking about human behavior and you yeah, open up denial. This, 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 this is the, the hard part. Um, one of the things that, among the things that you see in the U.S. is denial. Uh, denial that this is an important part, denial that masks work. I mean, uh, the, 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 I've had people literally ask me, isn't this just a hoax? Um, isn't this just a way for pharmaceutical companies to increase their profits? We've seen evidences of magical thinking. This is no different than the snake oil days for somebody to tout that a drug that hasn't been studied is effective in this, and then people start taking it or hoarding it. It is irrational behavior. Um, and this has, this has materially worsened this pandemic over what it should and could have been. Next slide. So the next one is related to the caution that you encourage. Yeah, I mean, I, what's the first bullet point on that? Immense public and governmental pressure for oh, treating yeah, vaccines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this has been, all of this uh, behavior has kind of been engendered, I guess, by, first of all, I would call it American hyper-individualism. We are a me and not a we culture. It's inconceivable to some Americans that they would be inconvenienced in order pr to protect older Americans in their community. It's in inconceivable. Um, that is not the case in other cultures that have very effectively handled this pandemic. Um, so 
there, there, there are a number of issues around this, and, and they all point to one thing, and that, that is human behavior. Uh, we literally have to make laws, for example, in this country to wear a seatbelt because of people's hyper-individualism and their misperceptions about the value of something like a, a seatbelt or of not selling cigarettes to people under the age of 18. We have to make laws about that. So it's not a particular surprise that this has happened. What's a surprise is that one would have thought that if nothing else, self-interest would have driven people to do to search out and follow evidence-based recommendations. Next slide. That's that's challenging in this environment, isn't it? Dr. Poland, because you've got, you have different sources for people, their news feeds come from different places today. And so in some place you're hearing about uh, a press release about some miracle drug. And on another slide, you're getting encouraged for caution in an environment where people are somewhat fearful. Um, yeah, it, it relates how, how again. How do people sort through that? Yeah, it, it again relates to um, the psychology. What all of us are prone to is what psychologists call belief-dependent realism. We make up our minds about something before we see the data and the data doesn't change it. You've seen that in the election. People are not really interested in the data. They've made up their mind for a variety of emotional or political uh, or even selfish uh, reasons. And then, and then nothing will, will change their mind from that. This has been very evident and a well-known phenomena in trying to manage uh, infectious diseases or prevent infectious diseases. So, you know, it's, so it's, it's uh, I, the way I kind of say it to people is, um, you know, what did your grocery store clerk say about your car's mechanical problem? And they look at me and they say, well, why would I have asked her? And <laughs> then it, then it kind of dawns on them as to what right. I'm saying. Why would you listen to your neighbor or to Fox News or to CNN talking heads who took eighth grade science, maybe a biology class 30 years ago in college and have no working knowledge of the actual evidence-based uh, issues surrounding this. And yet we do. <laughs> it's remarkable. Sure, so um, what what would you, uh, we can do this later, but maybe now is a good time to ask, what are the sources that are reliable that people can go to, um, you think, to find out information about how to act and what to do? And and uh, I think the next page you're talking about tensions, but yeah. particularly between speed and safety, but, but what sources can people go to, to uh, school leaders and you know, uh, us as individuals and family members uh, yeah. to find out how to proceed? So my recommendation prior to this past election cycle would have been to say that CDC has reliable information and FDA. Clearly, there has been uh, political pressure, and in some cases, they have, they have caved to that. Um, I think that's being corrected. And what they publish in the way of peer-reviewed literature, I think, is good. My personal recommendation would be to go to trusted sites. Uh, I'll, I'll tout Mayo Clinic's uh, site. You can go to YouTube and see well over 100 videos that I and other people have done. Similarly, you can go to Harvard, to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, to Duke, to Cleveland Clinic places that are science-based with a long history of credibility and a pledge uh, as we, you know, and, and unfortunately, I wish every physician adhered to it, but they don't. The pledge I took said, first do no harm. And it is harmful to give people mis or disinformation. It's harmful to give people information that suits your, you know, economic interests or political interests or job interests over the, the best information and the best welfare of the patient. So I would say 
just as you would not, you know, go to, I don't know, I can't think of a, a, a grocery a, store clerk for your, yeah, you uh, know, you, you want to go when you want to, when you want to look up something about your car's mechanics, you, you go to a trusted site, do the same thing with this. It's really no different. But because of belief dependent realism, we're drawn to sites that verify our pre existing biases. So, talk to us a little bit about the tensions that you mentioned speed and safety and, and yeah. uh, efficacy versus uh, the challenges of determining safety. Yeah, well, the way I, way I often put it to people is this way this, this canvas that we call COVID 19, we've got only weeks worth of knowledge. Yes, you know, 10 months times four weeks in a month, but that's only 40 weeks or so of knowledge. By contrast, we've been making influenza vaccines for almost 80, 80, 80 years, and we are still learning. As we talk, there are clinical trials taking place, testing better and better flu vaccines. What would lead us to the arrogance of thinking that we know everything about a vaccine inside of a handful of month clinical trial? That's magical thinking. We have to do it. It's the start of the journey. But to put this in front of people, and I'm not saying that, that good companies or, or good public health agency, agencies have done this, but I've seen the media do it. What would make us uh, educate our culture in that way, rather than saying, these are early data, okay? Data in science changes over time as we accumulate more and more data. So um, fortunately, serious side effects due to vaccines generally happen within six weeks of receiving a vaccine. We don't generally see side effects that occur months or years later. However, the proviso is these front runner vaccines are unlike any vaccines we've ever given in a mass uh, administration way to the public before. So it is going to take time to the extent that we um, say to people, well, we've done a clinical trial and we know safety data in 44,000 people over, let's say, four months. That's helpful information, but it's the beginning of the information road we need to travel down. And that's why I say there is a tension. You release this by emergency use authorization, that's very different than a fully licensed vaccine where in the US, let's just take the chicken pox vaccine that perhaps your kids got. From the time we started on that study to licensure was 20 years. In 20 years, you learn an awful lot about the virus and the vaccine. How much less do you know after five months compared to 10 years or 20 years? Wow. And that's what, I mean. that's what I mean by that. Well, what do we have to look forward to uh, uh, as you look to the fall and winter? You, you described some of it here on <laughs> anticipations. Well, what I told the New York Times and they picked up on it is uh, my personal opinion. I know I sound like Debbie Downer here, but uh, I, I want to share what I know and as realistically as I know. What I told them was we are in for a long and deadly winter. And I mean that in all seriousness. I think the next 10 weeks are likely to be chaotic. Uh, I think there'll be a transition time. That's always chaotic. And then uh, maybe we'll begin to see a plan. I hope a good plan, but who knows? Uh, the initial names being floated for uh, advisory committee are people I know, and I would say are, are good people. Uh, so hopefully that, that's a good sign. We'll begin to see one vaccine after another released by one mechanism or another. It will be confusing and chaotic for patients and for the providers who generally don't know that much yet about these vaccines. 
I, I hope we won't get any surprises other than pleasant surprises. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to distribute vaccine uh, fair, fairly quickly. I, I'm very concerned that because we live in a generally scientifically illiterate culture that is highly science and vaccine skeptical, that that will be a very tough thing to do. And it will unnecessarily prolong the duration of this pandemic and cause the compromise in quality of life and even death of many more people than it need be. So um, you moved from here to talk about this complacency cycle. Can you? Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, there, there's always a cycle. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't want to present this as this is unique to um, uh, coronavirus. This has happened with every pandemic. I, I will tell you this, maybe this will be interesting to you. Maybe it'll help you understand why I uh, speak uh, forcefully about this. Every international and national tabletop exercise, this is where we get together. The last one I did was the first week of December 2019, had a, a group of experts from around the world come in and tabletop exercise a pandemic. They always end in dissolution and change of regimes and governments and often anarchy as economic collapse begins to occur and the concomitant negatively synergistic events, uh, for example, of what this country is finally having to face in regards to uh, the fissures in our culture around economics, racism, uh, sexism, uh, et cetera. There's a lot of competing voices. There's a lot of angry voices. There's a lot of people frustrated with the lack of, of change. And this can be, in the wrong circumstances, a toxic mix in the context of a pandemic and economic challenges that uh, can be adverse. And so you always see, you see denial. You see a gradual uh, panic. Then you'll see an acceptance over this, generally a search for the guilty. Who can we blame for this? That's been true of every pandemic in, in history that we have written history about. There generally will be grudging acceptance and then a response generally conflated with conflicts of interest in one way or another. And then finally, God willing, um, an effective response and recovery. But our road to recovery at this point is not clear. Other countries have done it. You may have seen in Melbourne, Austria, they did a hard lockdown for 111 days. Other countries have controlled this. Uh, in you, the UK just went into a, they're calling it more of a soft lockdown. And other countries, if you're outside and you're not wearing a mask properly, you'll get a fine in the upper hundreds of dollars. So there, there are ways to do this. These, this has just not been acceptable uh, in our culture, uh, again, for a variety of reasons that we've talked about. So at, given this cycle that occurs really with any crisis, right? Not just with the virus or uh, with anything, is, the, is it, your suggestion here that um, uh, people should be taking the virus, I mean, the uh, vaccine as it becomes available, um, particularly given that there may be multiple vaccines, how do people sort through that? Yeah, um, they, 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 and, really won't, they really won't be able to. And I think what they have to do is be as informed as they can and then go to their healthcare provider and basically ask, what's the best vaccine for me with my medical condition or my risk factors? Uh, is, is there one that's better? Or I read this and that, what do you think? Um, you know, kind of thing. In, instead of, uh, you know, trying to sort through information they may not have access to or may not understand. But is the general, is a general recommendation that, um, 
having each of us take the vaccine, a vaccine or multiple vaccines, is that the best course of action generally for all of us as a population as a whole? No, um, question, no question about it. To the extent, to the extent, I don't know this yet, but to the extent that we have safe and effective vaccines, question is how safe, how effective, but to the extent that we have those, um, every individual who's eligible is well served to immunize the, themselves against this. We've begun to see reinfections and oftentimes those reinfections have been more severe. I know there are people out there thinking, well, you know, what's my odds of really getting sick? The only people I know, so you begin to see the psychology, the only people I know have, you know, had like the flu and have been home for a few days, but, you know, no big deal. Well, again, that's, that's what's called the availability heuristic. You don't know somebody who's died. You don't live in my world in the hospitals and clinics. And so you assume that equates to this being very rare. And, and that would be a wrong conclusion. What is, uh, one of the questions that we have uh, relates to any studies um, that go outside of the lab environments you've described where you have vaccines, social distancing and masks. Um, are there studies that you're aware of that have highlighted um, healthy lifestyle habits and boosting the immune system or those things that have been done on patients that would be deemed less susceptible as opposed to those that we've been able to specify that are more susceptible? Like, are yeah. there? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. That, that, that's a really good question, Stuart, and, and, and thank you for, for it because I might not have thought to address it. Um, the answer, the simple answer is yes. Um, these are things everybody knows, but few do. We know that a healthy diet, most Americans don't know what a healthy diet is. They think they're eating one, but they're eating uh, exceptionally high salt diets, for example, high fat diets. Um, so a healthy diet, controlling our stress, I'm not very good at that one, regular aerobic exercise, exposure to sunlight. That's how we make vitamin D. And low levels of vitamin D have been associated with more severe disease. That's not to say that supplementing with vitamin D changes that. It might, but that's something to ask your physician about. Um, uh, similarly with the, you know, what we call hands, space, and face. Wearing a proper mask properly when you're outside your home. Washing your hands properly. Again, these are things that people think they know how to do, but are doing incorrectly. Um, for those that are wondering, what do I mean about hand washing? Go to YouTube and search Dr. Poland and Jimmy Kimmel. I went on his show to show America how to wash your hands properly because I have never, ever, ever seen a lay person wash their hands properly. Um, surgeons, yes. Some physicians, yes. But other people, no, they just, they don't know. They think they know. Um, and then, as I say, uh, maintaining appropriate physical distancing. The problem with all of this is it bumps up against hyper-individuality and it bumps up, quite frankly, with conflicts of interest. Businesses what want to stay open. Restaurants sure. want to stay open. I understand that. Schools want to stay open. Sports teams want to play. But that is, to be very, very fair, it, you, you, one has to acknowledge that it is a conflict of interest. Okay, now having, having acknowledged that, how do we manage it? Well, let's, and let, and let's be fair. The conflict, you're not saying, hey, um, the most important thing we can do is eliminate the virus and the disease. You're saying, that has obvious negative effects on society. And there's a tension with all those other things, uh, the individualist, hyper-individualistic society yeah, or exactly. things we would enjoy doing, playing sports, or frankly, in this case, one of the things that's come up um, that I know you don't, you don't 
uh, express a complete opinion on, or nor is it the right place uh, really for each of us to do so, is the tension between opening school and the social and emotional benefit of having kids in school or economic benefit of having parents be able to go to work versus the tension with the increased risk of the spread of the virus. Those are things that uh, each of us or the school leaders are having to make decisions on for themselves. It's not just about controlling yeah, the virus. No, absolutely no question about that. Best place for a kid is in school. There is zero, in my mind, question about that. In fact, the demonstrated data suggests that at least for uh, segments of kids, when they're not in school, they do demonstrably worse academically, socially, mentally, for some kids nutritionally, and, and it kind of goes on and on. I don't know if you saw this report out of the UK. There's a group called Ofsted, which monitors uh, educational standards. They were shocked to find out in the youngest uh, grade school grades and kindergarten that kids were no longer using knives and forks properly. I mean, how, how big, how basic can you get that they're falling behind in reading level? Um, so, you know, you, then you say, okay, what does science tell us? Science shows us that you can manage opening grade schools really pretty well. Uh, they tend to be, those kids tend to be compliant. They'll do what's asked. Um, parents will reinforce the importance of it. While they can get infected, they tend not to be the super spreaders that that was feared. And there are, there are ways to physically arrange the environment to do it in an acceptable manner. It's a step harder when you get to junior high and high school because some of those presuppositions may not exist depending on the setting. But nonetheless, there are there are ways I think to manage it. We've been very involved in helping some uh, small liberal arts colleges to do this. They've done it very well. So even at the college level, we've demonstrated that it can be done. But it we've demonstrated this with Major League Baseball. Um, but it takes a commitment, if you will, for the whole ecosystem to do it right and to have a playbook with milestones that would say, at this point, we stop. Right, and it involves that involves a lot of coordination. Really? We have a couple of other questions that have a couple of other questions that are have come up, and I and I want to have take a moment to um, share at the end, or at least have people see, so they can go get these abstracts. Um, uh, some of the reports you have attached the materials. I do want to, I do want to, since I started off with Camus, I want to show my, my last slide. Absolutely. That's the next page. Okay. I won't be able to exactly remember it, but I'll do my best. It basically says something like, uh, wars and plagues have always been a part of, uh, uh, of our history. Somehow we find it hard to believe in those that crash down on our heads out of a blue sky. And yet always wars and plagues take people equally by surprise. And he was real, I'm no existentialist as Camus was, but he really was putting his finger on an important piece of human behavior. And if you'll notice, at least what I attempted to do is give you a broad overview of the science, particularly as related uh, to vaccines and sprinkle in a few philosophers and writers to demonstrate the issues of uh, and, and the substantial barriers we have around human behavior. So uh, I, I just wanted to end with that. And then Stuart, whatever, I'm happy to stay. Uh, I have something at 1.30, but I'm happy to stay uh, and answer as many questions as you want me to. Well, what we're gonna do uh, now is there were a few pages at the back end. Uh, I'm just going to pause on each one of them so people can see them. Well, you these are the current status of the vaccine front runners, and then there are two articles. Uh, I just want people to be able to see. Can you just summarize what's here on the? Yeah. So the, the first one. Yeah, yeah, the first one in the Mayo Clinic proceedings was an early article we wrote. Um, talking about the front-runner vaccines and the issues as, as I saw them. 
The second and more recent was just published a week and a half ago, I think, in the journal Lancet, probably uh, one of the highest visibility and most credible medical journals in the world. We published a review of the immunology of this disease and its application. So if people were interested in that article, the back pages of that article provide you know, two or three paragraph summaries of each of the vaccines. Okay, um, I think that's that's great. And you gave a, a schedule for people to uh, look at and hopefully they'll be able to see this. And um, uh, there were a couple of questions came up that we didn't really touch on, but I think are worth touching on, which are related to the interaction of the vaccines, particularly those things coming in the next year with people like, so those people who have had negative reactions to flu shots or flu vaccines, is it likely that the COVID-2 or uh, COVID-19 vaccines will be um, safe for those people or are they uh, more susceptible to the risk? If you had a, you know, if you have bad flu vaccine uh, reaction, yeah. are you likely to well, have a negative reaction here or no overlap? Yeah, let me let me go back to a study and paper I published in 19, I think about 92 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. We took 600 people, gave 300 of them a flu shot, 300 a saltwater placebo. We didn't know what we were giving them. They didn't know what they were getting. Only the pharmacist knew and she wasn't talking. We called them two days later, went over all the side effects people say they get from flu vaccine. Two weeks later, we repeated the study by giving them what they didn't get the first time, calling them two days later. So what's called a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial, the strongest clinical trial design we know of. And what we showed is absolutely no difference in side effects between people who got a saltwater placebo shot and people who got the flu vaccine. So the only contraindication to getting a flu vaccine is having had a major anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine or having developed Guillain-Barre within six weeks of having gotten that vaccine. Those are the unknown, and that, all, those two together are very, very rare. So then you have to say, well, what do we mean by safety? Let me just portray it this way. Would you be willing to have a sore arm for a day or two, maybe a low grade fever, but be able to go to your kid's wedding or not have to be out of work for 14 days? Because once you get infected, you have to quarantine or not be admitted to the hospital or not be on a ventilator. And that's the trade off that each of us will have to make. There's, there's pain and inconvenience. I don't consider that a safety issue. That's a tolerance maybe uh, would be the better word for it. The safety issue is, is there a reaction that compromises my health uh, or is going to cause a problem uh, for me? I would say that based on what I know right now for the four front runner vaccines, they are more reactogenic. This is the tolerability. I don't have any information that suggests they represent a threat to one's health or safety, but they are more reactogenic than the vaccines you're used to getting. Which means that you're gonna have more soreness and or a low grade fever but you know, what, what, we've seen, what we've seen are people be virus resistant. What's that? You'll have some of these symptoms that you described, maybe a low grade fever or soreness, but you will be more virus resistant. Is that correct? That's what you're right. saying? That's, the, that's the idea. That's the idea behind raising an immune response to it. Now, for, for um, maybe 50 percent of us, it'll be a ah, sore arm. Um, fever, headache, um, you know, how you feel when you got hit with the flu, um, fatigue, and you'll go to bed for a day or two and then recover from that and go to work. 
So and then I, that will avoid. Even though, but, even but though I'm a vaccinologist, I don't want to trivialize the reactogenicity of this. These are reactogenic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so one of the questions that people had was given those that are expected to arise in the next year, the vaccines, are you recommending that with pro appropriate advice on which one to take from their healthcare uh, professional, um, you're recommending that better to take the vaccine uh, in most cases uh, yeah. than not, here's, subject here's to the not. other caveats about all that. You'd say, uh, as individuals, we should, um, it is better for overall, for society, for us to be participating in taking the vaccine. And you think that they're likely to be safe -er, even though we don't have 20 years of testing. Is that yeah, your so, perception so or think, perspective? What, yeah, let me just clarify. So I think there are two components to the decision. There's the me decision and there's the we decision. Okay, the me decision is which vaccine to get. The we mm -hmm. decision is should I get a vaccine? Okay. So if yep. large numbers of people don't get a vaccine, the pandemic will simply continue. And so no one will ever be safe. If we all get vaccines, then it amounts to an individual decision. If you're a very high risk person and you have the opportunity to get a uh, vaccine by emergency use authorization, I'd probably do it. If you're not, like I'm 65, I'm completely healthy, I will probably wait, though I'm a healthcare provider, I will probably get a licensed vaccine. Um, and you know, maybe vaccines will even be released, as I say, by expanded access. I'd probably get one under expanded access. But my desire as a vaccinology, vaccinologist would be, I wanna see the data. And we don't, sure. yet, have, and we don't yet have those data. Thank you. Um, Dr. Poland, I, I just want to say uh, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise uh, and uh, information with um, the charter school leaders across the country who joined us today. Uh, there were a lot of them. Um, I'll say that uh, it's impressive to me. We're, it's, it's a quarter after the hour. Uh, we've run over 15 minutes. And 95% uh, um, uh, of the people who started are still on. So, um, I, if it, and I, so, so you may be um, self-conscious about how it went without, you know, the materials in front of you. But um, very engaging, very informative. Um, well, and I, I, I really appreciate that. And, and I'd like to just say one other thing because. In the effort to get a lot of information across and cut through all the myths and disinformation, my wife says sometimes I can sound strident <laughs> or forceful. Um, let me just say that, that that's intentional in terms of getting your attention and, as I say, cutting through to the, the science as we know it. But it's also important to acknowledge what, what you all do. My wife and I were one of the founding families of a, of a private school. We think it's very important. We think what you all do is exceptionally important uh, in, in, the, in the workings of a society. In fact, if it were up to me, I would say uh, school teachers and administrators are essential personnel. Senators and congressmen are not. Um, <laughs> that might be construed as a political statement, but I mean it more as a, a sociologic uh, statement. So bravo for what you do. I, I cannot imagine how difficult it has been to try to you know, cobble together hybrid and, and in-person uh, classroom instruction during these very difficult, tumultuous times, but uh, it's apparent that you've done it well. So from a member of the public, thank you. Well, again, we really appreciate it. I expect we'll have greater opportunity over the course of the next few months to potentially do this again as more information becomes available. And um, for love. everybody who joined us today, thank you. And Dr. Poland, anything else you want to add? No, just blessings on you all. And uh, I guess I'm going to get a new computer. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs>
My well, apologies. Uh, um, well, thank you very much for your expertise today and, and for sharing with us. All right. Uh, we appreciate everybody, everybody and particularly you. So think, with that, think, we'll think positive, but test negative. <laughs> thank you. All, All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.